Well, happy Friday and welcome back to another episode of the 4 Men Podcast. My guest today is Rich Wilkerson Jr. And Rich is someone I've been wanting to have on the podcast for a while now, and I'm so thankful that we were able to make it happen. So Rich, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I've been wanting to come on for a while now, so I'm glad we found some time and obviously big fan of yours and appreciate all that you're doing. I'm excited to uh, chat today. Awesome. Well, big fan of yours. I don't know if you know this, so I think it was when I was in high school, maybe a freshman in college. I've actually never told you this, so this is funny. Me and my brother bought, it, was, it wasn't Sandcastle Kings. What was the, Friend of Sinners? Yep. Yeah, we bought, we bought your uh, signed copy of Friend of Sinners when we were, we were both, I think I was maybe a freshman in college, maybe. Whatever, it, whatever, it was, it was early on. And we both, I still have it in my, in my house, actually, your signed copy of, of, of Friend of Sinners. I, that book changed my life. Bro, that makes me so happy to hear that. Um, how did you get that? It just like, I, I was selling signed copies or, or we were somewhere like, that's amazing. No. So I started following you after you preached, um, what's, what, what's the message called? Is it, is it Jesus in the wheelbarrow or oh my the, goodness, the one yeah. about the wheelbarrow? Life, life in the wheelbarrow. Life in the wheelbarrow. I used to preach a message called yeah. life in the wheelbarrow. So I started following you from that. And then it was just on social media. You were just like you were, you were like the book Finding was coming. Or something. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, the book was coming out, and you did like a limited, like edition or like a limited release or something on like signed copies. And I was like, we we got to get the signed copy book, dude. I love that. That that makes me so happy. Um, I'll sign any book that I've ever written for you, man. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll address it personally to you. Oh, that means a lot. No, but <laughs> man, no, seriously, life life in the wheelbarrow seriously is one of my favorite messages I've ever heard. It was so practical. But just so like, just so empowering. So uh, I, this, I literally don't even have this. For those listening, can you kind of explain what, like, what that message was about, real quick? Yeah, man, that's that's an old school sermon. I preached that message the first time. I, I'm gonna say maybe 2015 or 2016 uh, at VU conference. Every summer we do this big event. This year now it's called VU convention, VU con. But it's our big gathering every summer. We used to do it on the uh, at the Fillmore, Jackie Gleason kind of historic theater on South Beach, and um, whatever year that was, I preached uh, when Jesus says, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the, pa- the Father but through me." And um, so much of that message was just, I think a lot of people look at that statement from Jesus, and I think words we can kind of create connotations with words, and so. One of the words that people kind of associate in a negative way is that's such an exclusive statement. That's such a statement that is keeping people out. And don't get me wrong, it definitely is uh, an exclusive statement. But rather than kind of go down that rabbit trail of a negative connotation, I see the positive connotation, which it's not exclusive as much as it it is specific. (laughs) Meaning that Jesus, out of his love for us, is making it very, very clear how to get to the father's house. And uh, there was an old illustration that I heard, I don't know, when I was a kid about a tightrope walker. His name was Charles Blondin. I think in the late 1800s, he used to ride, walk on tightropes and um, did all sorts of different acts. And, you know, sort of in that world, the circus world, uh, trapeze artist world, it's always kind of like upping yourself and doing mm-hmm. bigger things and better things and crazier things. And so one of his craziest stunts was that he took a, a wire and stretched it across the gorge of Niagara Falls. And he would walk across this. And if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, I mean, this is raging, rushing water. And Mm -hmm. I can only imagine watching someone do this. The wind is blowing. And so he had done this a couple of times. He started doing all sorts of different things. Started taking, like he would get himself in a, um, like a sack of potatoes and like, and like hop over it. He, one time, I guess he sat out there and like made breakfast on the wire. But one of the big stunts that he did is he took a wheelbarrow across the wire. And the famous story or the famous illustration from Charles Blondin is that he walks across with the wheelbarrow and he gets over there. And uh, when he sees everyone, the, they're, they're cheering. They're going, you're amazing. And he says, well, how many of you believe I can get back to the other side? And they're like, of course. Yeah, we believe. And they all cheer and celebrate. He says, okay, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow as I push you across? And the place was silent. And and the premise of the talk is there's a big difference between believing in Jesus and trusting in Jesus. And when you trust in Jesus, it's to say, I'm going to live my life in the wheelbarrow. And 
I think that's really the call of, of real Christianity today, which is to say, I want to get out on the tightrope. I believe that Jesus is the only way. I believe that he is the truth. I believe he's the life I have been looking for. The life I'm looking for is life in that wheelbarrow with Jesus pushing, Jesus leading, Jesus guiding. I can feel the mist of the Niagara Falls. I can feel the wind blowing me. The, the rope at times is shaky. Don't get me wrong, it's scary. But I don't just believe in this God. I trust in this God that he can get me from point A to point B. And uh, that's how I want to live my life. And so that was sort of the heart of the talk. But I haven't given that talk in a long time. And the fact that you just brought it up, no, that Maybe is I'll preach it this Sunday. That is one of like the simplest, most just clear illustrations for me of, of of really what it is. Because it's so true. Like, you know, there is such a distinction between belief and like truly following. And you see that all through scripture, you know. Yes, like, you know, when when John 14 6, it's not exclusive, but Jesus is definitely, you know, harsher to people who are following him, you know, of like, you know. Birds have uh, birds have necks. Fo- birds have nests. Foxes have holes. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Like, are you sure that you want to follow me? There is, you know, like a trust that goes in. What do you think? Like, how do you think that practically plays out in our life? Having that distinction between just belief versus truly trusting and following. Yeah, I mean, remember when Jesus he or the scripture says, you know, um, even the demons believe and, and they shudder. So the idea of believing in Jesus, there really shouldn't be any. If you know history, Jesus lived. I think everyone should believe in Jesus. Yeah. I think the real crossover is is the idea of trusting Jesus. And I think the distinction of the practical application is, is that it's easy to trust in Jesus on mountaintops, but faith comes alive when we're trusting Jesus in valleys. Mm-hmm. And so I think the way that we, how this works out in our life is, is how do you respond to suffering? Mm-hmm. How do you respond to bad days? How do you respond to negative things? How do you respond to when you don't get what you want. And I think we live in a world if we're not careful. And I'm even trying to be careful with my words because I fall victim to this. Yeah. I, God is not a genie, you know? I think it was, I heard it many years ago. Some people, they kind of pretend like uh, like God is is a pinata and, and prayer is the stick, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I disagree with that notion. I think that we serve an all-sufficient, omnipotent, big God, a sovereign God who sees everything from, you know, from the end, from the beginning to the end. And he has a totally different perspective. And so trust is to say, God, I'm surrendering my life. And at times I might even feel like I'm falling off the wire. At times I might even be convinced that I have fallen fully off that wire. Mm -hmm. But even as I'm falling off the wire, I'm reminded that this world is a temporary world. And the faith journey is one to not walk by sight, but to walk by faith. Faith to me is, is the absence of sense. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we cannot see. And so when I try to practically apply trust to people, it's going, I'm going to find a sense of peace and contentment regardless of my circumstance, regardless of how things go for me. Um, I'm not living my life for how they go for me. I'm living my life for the glory of God. That's a big distinction. That's where you start getting into like Paul's letters. And he says things like, I learned how to be content, whether I have a lot or a little, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, naked or clothed. Um, what does he say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't think that that verse is about, you know, getting the W on the football field, although it, it can be, but I think it's deeper than that. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's discovering contentment in all circumstances. It's really going, I can do all things through Christ, even if we lose the game. Mm-hmm. I can still find joy in the midst of the defeat. So when you ask that question, like, what does that practically look like trust? I think that you don't really know if you have faith until you have to use your faith. Yeah. And if the first time you've ever activated your faith is when you need it, you're probably late to the game. So I think that these are things that we have to rehearse, call out, speak out, talk about, um, remind ourselves that God, I want to trust in you. It's easy to trust God in blessing. It's, it's hard to trust God in the burden or in the lack or in the suffering. And so uh, practically for me, it's when things don't go my way. That's when I have to activate, am I living my life in the wheelbarrow or am I living my life for me? So if you've been listening to this podcast or if you've been following me on social media, then obviously you know that I'm a big fan of ice baths. I love them because they're great for my recovery. They help me with uh, my mental clarity. They help reduce my inflammation. They help my HRV. There's really so many great benefits and I love it because it's a challenge for me. You know, it's tough to stay uh, under the water for whatever 
lo- however long that you're wanting to. It's adrenaline rush, honestly. Before I'm about to get in, I get my blood gets pumping, I get super pumped, and I love um, just the results that I've seen uh, physically from doing the ice bath, but as well just mentally. So I've been doing ice bath for a while, but I just got an ice barrel, and it's a cold therapy training tool that makes it super easy to incorporate ice baths in your routine. And if you're listening to this and you don't really know a lot of the benefits of cold therapy or of what an ice barrel can do, it improves your recovery and it gives you better performance and improves mood and brain function, helps alleviate depression and anxiety. It activates the nervous system, helps with pain management, it reduces inflammation, and it improves your heart rate variability. But what makes ice barrel unique and, in my opinion, better than all the other ones is how you can sit upright in the barrel. I think it looks good. It does not take up any space. I love the the, the way that the barrel looks, honestly, in my backyard. It's uh, lightweight, it's portable, and there's a spigot on the bottom that you can drain. And I like that you can get one for as little as $90 a month. It's durable, it's compact, it's made in the USA, and it's made of 100% recycled material. And so I worked with Ice Barrel to get y'all $125 off so that you can try it out and see if you like it as much as I do. I threw a link in the show notes and you'll see me sharing more on social media too. You can go to icebarrel.com slash Christian and use code Christian to get $125 off. Ice Barrel offers a 30-day money-back guarantee and 100% satisfaction. Again, that's icebarrel.com slash Christian and use code Christian to get $125 off. Get colder, feel better, and let me know what y'all think. Man, that's so good. I definitely, you know, I think we all fall victim to that like you talked about it. And if you, you know, with, with Paul's letters in 1 Corinthians 15, he's explaining the gospel and he says that this gospel saves you if you hold firmly to it, otherwise you've believed in vain. And those conjunctions are so, I guess, so powerful. That's what we talk about a lot. It's like if and otherwise. So it's like, yeah, this this saves you if you hold firmly to it. Otherwise, you bleed in vain. So there's, you know, like you said, Jesus was a historical, you know, he truly lived. So you can, you can believe he lived. So how do you, you know, what's that distinction between believing he lived versus just believing, you know, all this in vain? Because it, it, it really is such a scary thought of like, you know, I can go do all the things. I can be at church every Sunday. I can you know, pray, but, you know, has that faith actually been activated in my life? Or is it something that maybe I've even just convinced myself that I believe? I don't know. It's, it, it's such a scary thought, just reading, you know, the if and the otherwise in that, in that verse. Absolutely. I think that what you're landing on, I, I love the ideas of all the conjunctions and yet, but so, <laughs> you know, yeah. all those things. It's like, here is the truth. And if that truth takes root in your life, here's what the fruit will look like. And so um, I think I would encourage anybody out there who's listening, uh, perfect love casts out all fear. And so I don't think we have to be afraid. I think that we should be aware and we should walk in self-awareness and we should say, all right, if there's areas of my life that there seems to be wrong living, why would there be wrong living? probably because somewhere there's wrong believing. And before we can attack the behavior, we have to always get to the source of it, which is the heart. And faith, uh, the spirit of God at work in us takes root. And so the idea of believing in Jesus is an act of faith that I'm going, all right, yeah, I believe that he lived, but now I have to actually consider, do I believe he is who he said that he is? Was it C.S. Lewis's like great, quote that Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord, you know, like he, he can't be just a good teacher. He's, he's either a liar, he's either crazy, or he is who he said that he is. And as you consider that, I think then, all right, if I believe that he's Lord, how does that show up in my life? Um, sanctification, the process of becoming like Jesus, no doubt is a process. It, it's a full-on process. Thank God that justification, I believe in a moment I'm justified. But even like on your podcast right now, like we are in process to becoming like Jesus. And all of that is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit and us believing in this God who is taking root in my life and that Jesus, my body is the temple of your spirit, live through me. That's why I think even what you're talking about is so interesting because I think the way that we take care of this body, I think sometimes in church, it only kind of gets talked about one way. Like if you're real old school, it's like, don't drink alcohol. Um, don't smoke cigarettes. 
And if you're real old school, don't tattoo your body. Why would you put a bumper sticker on a Ferrari? You know, like, and um, aside from the tattoo thing, I think the other things have quite great merit to have conversation. But if we're really talk about this temple of the Holy Spirit, it, it goes far beyond just, you know, over consuming alcohol or giving yourself away to an addiction of cigarettes. It's talking about, man, like this body's, this body's going to decay and die. But there is something quite spiritual about my body. This is the thing that's housing my soul for the time being. And so my body's not in charge. I'm going to make my body submit. My flesh is going to submit. I'm going to discipline my flesh and I'm going to manage it and steward it for the glory of God. And so that's why we talk about things like fitness and working out. It's not just physical. It's quite spiritual and it's, it's unto the glory of God. And I think that uh, what you're doing is, is so, so cool because to me, it's just one of those areas about what do I really believe? Do I really believe this thing is the temple of the Holy Spirit? All right, then why isn't my behavior showing forth? Because there would be the conjunction. If I believe that, then or so go and go and do this. Yeah, that's so good. Well, something that I love that you do on Sunday mornings before, um, you know, you go preach early in the morning, you'll post on social media and you'll say church before church. And I love that little... Yep. I love that tagline. So is that kind of, you know, what you just explained? Is that kind of what you're meaning when you say church before church? Yeah, for me, church before church was something that we began. Man, I've been doing it. We started our church in 2015 in a little middle school in Wynwood. If you've ever been to South Florida or to Miami, I should really say, Wynwood is like the arts district, really cool space. And we found this middle school and we launched with 11 a.m. and a 6 p.m. service. And uh, we actually just hit the seven-year mark. But man, like we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, God was so gracious towards us. And, you know, we had to bump in early because we had to like load in all the production stuff. So I, I think their call time was like 5 a.m. for an 11 a.m. service. Just we didn't know how to set the screen up and there was a band rehearsal. And, but then we go at 11 a.m. and then we didn't have service again until 6 p.m. at night. And so then the, like the loadout was like at 11 o'clock at night. So we had these two massive like windows of like loading in and loading out and, and developing teams. But God was gracious towards it. The church began to grow. And I think we launched in September. By the time we got to January, I think we were in three services. I think by the time we got to the following September, we were in four services. And I think by the time we got to that following January, so now we're in the year and a half mark, I think we're at five services. And bro, when I started preaching five times, this is back in like 2017, I, I just, it was taking me such a long time to recover on Monday and Tuesday. I also had this little like accident. I think it was right around 2016 where I was in Shreveport, Louisiana. Shout out to all the Louisiana people. Um, but my, my wife, Christian and I are very wise. We, uh, we found the greatest thing that was ever created in Louisiana, our wives, and we married them. Um, but uh, my wife's from Shreveport, not far from where you guys are. And I was actually at home for Thanksgiving. I think it was 2000 and I think it was 2016. And I was on one of those like gator, is that what they're called? Like I'm, I'm looking at you like you should know, like, like a gator ATV golf cart. Kind of oh yeah. 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 But it was like a souped up golf cart with uh -huh. my brother-in-law Dakota. And I'm like, I don't know why, why. I, I was like pretending that like, I thought it was like a jet ski. And so I'm trying to like spin it out and bro, I took a corner. We flipped this thing. I messed my neck all up. And literally that fall, that injury, this is always kind of like how God works too. Like this really bad thing led me to go into like physical therapy, a chiropractor, and I also started going into the gym and I met my trainer who now goes to our church. His name is Manning Sumner and uh, he has a gym in Miami called Legacy. And I didn't know that however many years ago that was, 2016, 2017, that, that was going to become a start of a brand new pattern and habit in my life. Well, once I got that going, once we hit the five service mark, I was just waking up on Tuesdays so like lethargic and tired. I was like, I've got to get more energy produced. And so... I kind of just started studying like things that like, you know, we live in our little subcultures. So preachers are like, this is the hardest job in the world. I'm like, is this really the hardest job in the world? I feel like, you know, NFL athletes go out there every Sunday and beat their bodies to a pulp. And somehow they do it week in and week out. I think I can figure out how to preach every week. Yeah. But what I started learning was about like NFL athletes, it's like on game days, they're, they're waking up still doing some sort of cardio. A lot of times the day after an NFL game, they're, they're in the gym first thing doing, doing different types of workout, which is, you know, a lot of it's cardio, a lot of it's recovery things. And so I was like, maybe on Sundays, I need to get going before I start preaching. And that's what began church before church. I used to go into the gym by myself 
with my brother-in-law, actually. We'd pump worship music and I would do a 45 minute cardio workout and I'd come in for the 9 a.m. service like, let's go, you know? That's awesome. <laughs> but we started to kind of put it on social and we started calling it church before church. And before you know it, it sort of just became a big habit of my life, which is now when I preach in Miami, yeah, I'm in the gym at 6 a.m. and there's a few guys that show up with me and it's setting the tone. We play worship music, we pray together, and it's sort of like the service before the service. And so we always just called it church before church. But like I'm saying, it's not just a physical thing. It, it really has been a very, it's a spiritual thing for me. It's about me getting my mind, body, and spirit prepared to minister for the entire day. Yeah, that's awesome. And you feel like that's that like that's really played a difference in, you know, the lethargic after after your sermons? All of it. I mean, pre and post. Yeah. I think I want to go into a Sunday. And to me, I kind of look at it like it's my game day. Like that's awesome. I've been plotting and preparing all week and I want to go into the best version of myself. I want to be fully awake. So yeah, we we work out, we sauna for 30 minutes, we cold plunge. There you go. And so by the by the time I rock up for the 10 a.m. service, man, I've been up since 5.30. We've done a full workout. I am uh, I feel vibrant and ready. And it's kind of the same thing on Monday. It's like waking up Monday morning and uh, and putting my body in charge. My, my, my body's not in charge of me. How I feel is not in charge of me. I've, I've submitted that over to the purpose of my life. And uh, my body has value, but my body's not my Lord. My, my body's not my God. Uh, I have one true God and, and he gets my body. And so that's, that's the heart behind it. That's the belief. That's the theology behind it. And then the behavior I think is, is how it's showing up. So if you're like me, maybe use your phone as an alarm clock or, you know, you just like to check the time throughout the night, uh, which is what I like to do. And I used to really check social media before I went to bed. I would check, you know, social media, I would check the news and it would just create stress or anxiety or whatever it'd be for me. So instead of doing that, I've been checking the Abide app before I'm going to sleep. And it's really helped me to not be anxious, to not be stressed, to not, um, you know, be worrying about the worries of our world and really just to fill myself with the spirit and peace of Christ. And same thing with the mornings. I used to check social media. I used to check the news. And instead of doing that, I've been using the Abide app and opening that in the mornings when I've been stressed or anxious. And I've been listening to the meditations and it's been a comfort for me. And Abide is also the number one Christian meditation app. And their users report less stress, lower levels of anxiety and depression, and also better sleep. And I can advocate for that. If I check the Abide app before I go to sleep, I honestly sleep better than if I check social media before I go to sleep. And same thing in the mornings. If I uh, start my day with the news, it's going to make me more anxious. It's not going to help me be at, uh, at peace. And if I check the Abide app, I'm ready for the day. I'm comforted and I'm not stressed or worried about whatever is going on in the world. And for a limited time, our listeners will get 25% off a premium subscription when you text MEN to 22433. And their meditations start at two minutes long. They're easy to fit in your schedule, and they feature topics like overcoming anxiety, managing stress, addiction and recovery, finding forgiveness, and so much more. And at the end of the day, you can find deep rest and abide bedtime stories based on the Bible, and they're great for kids and adults alike. Before I'm going to sleep, I like the bedtime story ones because, like I said, they just put me at ease. And in the mornings, I like the meditations. I like being in silence. I like, um, you know, really just honing in for a couple minutes on, um, you know, things that I need before I start the day. And you can get started right now with 25% off a premium subscription by texting MEN to 22433. You'll get additional stories and meditations, premium music, soothing sounds, and so much more. Support this show and get 25% off by texting MEN to the number 22433. Well, before this podcast started, we talked a little bit about your uh, current workout routine and you, you were saying that you started running more lately. In this past year, you also ran a half marathon. What made you want to do that? Was that harder than you expected or easier than you expected? So you'll love it. This is like so just typical. Like I'm in staff meeting on Monday. This is January of 2022. Yeah. Did I run it this year? Yeah. And um, we do a staff meeting on Monday and there's a, uh, some girls on our team that were like that Monday in staff meeting talking about, Oh, we can't wait this weekend. We're not going to be, we call it a block and B block. We have morning church and night church. And they're like, we're not going to be in the a block at church because we're running the half marathon. And the girls that were running it, like I know them well. And like, I wouldn't, I never knew them to be like 
you know, gym rats by any means. I'm like, well, yeah. hold on. Y'all are, I'm like, how long is a half marathon? They're like, it's 13 miles. I'm like, and y'all are running that? They're like, yeah, yeah, we've been training for it. And I was like, bet. I'm like, these girls are my staff. I'm like, if they can do this, you're going to have to, I, I can do this. Like, I'm going to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, I had never, to my knowledge, ran more than five miles before, <laughs> but I, I somehow finagled my way into getting a bib. And I was like, I'm running it. I just, I said it's happening. And I was like, I'm, I'm running the half marathon. They're like, what? You haven't really trained. I was like, I was like oh, if y'all are doing it, I'm doing it. You're on my team. I'm on your team. Let's go. And so I kind of like had it all planned out because I had to preach that, that Sunday at 9 a.m. And I was like, all right, we, we kick off at six. I don't know if I can actually run a half marathon. If by, by 845, I've got to be on the road to get to church, to, to get there by 905, to take a quick shower and to be on the stage at 930. That was like my mind, you know? So I was like at 845, wherever I'm at, I'm bailing. There's a couple markers along the way. But bro, I, I started off running. I felt good. And uh, yeah, I completed that thing before my cutoff time. I went to church. I preached all day. I, I, felt, I felt great. And so um, that was the running joke. After that moment, I never ran again. Yeah. And then about, about six weeks uh, ago, I kind of started running again. I was in Israel a few weeks ago and some guys on my team are training because the marathon in Miami shows up in January. And they said, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we were in Tel Aviv. I was like, you guys are running tomorrow? They're like, yeah, we're going to run six miles. I was like, I haven't ran since the half marathon, but I'm going to run with you in the morning. So I went and ran six miles in Tel Aviv. And that was about four weeks ago now, maybe. Yeah, maybe around that six weeks. And so I've ran like 10 miles, 12 miles, eight miles. I don't really have a really strong, consistent pattern, but I'm going to run the half marathon again in January. But I, I need to do a full. That's what I want to awesome. do. Yeah, I was going to ask you two questions. See, I was going to ask one if you were maybe going to plan on doing the uh, the full marathon in January. And two, if you beat the girls in, on your staff in the half marathon. <laughs> yes, I beat the girls on, on, our, on my staff. That was the whole thing. I was like, they motiv made, motivated me, but I was like, they're not beating me. But one of those girls now is running the full marathon. She's lost 40 pounds. She's a wow. legend. Uh, I want to run the full, bro. I just think like, I think I actually have to train for that. You know what I yeah, mean? You, you definitely I don't have to train like, for that. I don't like setting myself up to quit or fail at something, you know? Yeah. So I kind of ran the half with a kind of like a, a fun spirit of going, oh yeah, yeah. Like I have to preach at nine. So if I have to bail early, it wasn't going to be considered qu quitting in my mind. It was like, oh, I have to, I couldn't run it in time. If I run the full, yeah, I just have mad respect. I, I know what it feels like at 13 miles. So it's like, how do I do that another time? Yeah. Would you, would you say that you're a competitive person? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's why, that's why I don't play a lot of sports anymore because if I'm not playing basketball consistently, I'm not going to go out on the court with you and get destroyed. Yeah. That's why I played golf a whole lot in my life. Uh, after college, I haven't played golf in a long time and I still love golf. I will come back to golf, but I'm not coming back to golf until I can beat some people yeah. and I have no time with three kids to play golf. So yes, I'm a very competitive person. I'm that's, in a pickleball right now. That's so funny. You just said that. Cause my next question was, I was going to say, I know that you love going to sporting events. I was going to ask if you played any sports growing up. I played. So I grew up in Tacoma, Washington. And then in 1998, we moved to Miami, Florida. And so I played everything until about 1998. And then that move to Miami played football my freshman year. And then I moved schools my sophomore year. And all of that is where my testimony kind of starts to kick in. Cause I just, I think all the moving, I, I, I kind of quit organized sports, which was not a smart move on my part. But I grew up playing basketball, football, soccer. Um, so I, I, I loved all sports, played all sports. And uh, from sophomore year on, I just sort of was out of it. I played water polo my junior and senior year, uh, awesome. going to school in Fort Lauderdale, which was really cool. And these days, yeah, I just, I, I'm in the gym and I play pickleball right now. So I'm ready to play anybody in pickleball. And if I lose, that's because you're a lot better than me. But uh, next time I see you, we'll have to play pickleball. Yes, we do, and you should prepare to lose money and <laughs> and lose some and lose some pride. Okay, well, well, I, I'll I'll take that as a challenge because I'm super competitive as well, and I I, I usually don't lose. <gasps> I know you are. I usually don't lose in pickleball either, so we'll uh, we'll have to make it happen. <laughs> do y'all play pickleball out there in West Monroe? We don't have a dang court here, man. Uh, we we have we have those like makeshift tennis court pickleball kind of stuff, but uh, no, whenever whenever we go to places, we um, 
you know, well, if we go to, uh, we were in California last year on Sadie's family vacation. We did a huge pickleball tournament, but when we go to Florida, so when we go to Florida to go see my parents, they, there's a court there that we'll go play at. Um, bro, my neighbor took his driveway. If you can imagine this and just flatten it all out a concrete slab. And for a year we just played with like chalked out concrete slab and a portable net. Now he had like the sport court guys come in and they put yeah. the green and they painted the lines Oh, that's awesome! and we went and hung a massive light up in the tree. So brother, we'll start playing like from 10 to midnight. It's just his front yard. There's yeah. no fencing and bro, we will play gay. It's hilarious, but it's actually a great pickleball experience. I think it's like street pickleball. It's like what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. And we have a tree up, we have a light up in a tree and this thing just illuminates, bro. It's a extension cord up the tree and this thing gets the job done. All right. Well, well, uh, if we ever go to Miami, we'll, we'll definitely make this, this street pickleball, the street pickleball game happen. Well, you got to come because we got to do a whole like workout session at Legacy. Yeah. A whole pickleball game. And then we got to go preach the gospel. You it's going to be, it's going to be sick. So stay, if you're listening to this, stay tuned for, for Christian and Rich's uh, workout pickleball vlog slash, yes, slash yes, gospel yes. presentation. The people want this, man. You know, oh, they really do. How? What are the parallels between the paddle and Christ? Like you're, you're like trying to preach Jesus yeah. through the pickleball paddle, you know? It's like, all right, we get it, man. That's so funny. Well, you, uh, you just alluded to, um, to your testimony. That was my net. It's so funny. You keep saying these things and this is literally the next question that I'm asking you. Um, so you're growing up, your dad was a pastor. Um, was there ever a moment for you where, you know, cause, cause for, for, for me, for instance, my parents weren't pastors, but there was a moment in my life where I went from, you know, what I knew growing up to where my faith really became real to me. Were you kind of always just, you know, in the church, you knew what you were doing? Or was there a moment where, you know, you had a defining moment where your faith really became real to you and you had a, had a change in your life? Yeah, I love that whole like idea of not every miracle that Jesus does. In fact, there's, a, there's actually a clear picture of it in uh, Mark's gospel, most miracles that Jesus did in the New Testament were instant miracles, but some are like what I call like a progressive miracle, which I think is a picture of sanctification. It's the process. It's the man who was blind and he takes him outside of the village. And then all of a sudden he prays for him and he's like, can you see anything? He's like, I see people. They look like trees walking around and he prays again. And then he's, he's able to, to see it. I think it just kind of shows the miracle sort of happening in stages. I think for me, my testimony, like, there were stages to it. From a young age, I was always very sensitive to God. Like I was always a believer in God at, um, man, at a young age, like 12 and 13, 12, 13, 14, I was on fire for Jesus in Washington and our youth group at, in sixth grade, man, I was bold about Jesus. I was thinking about Jesus. I wanted to preach the gospel seventh grade, eighth grade. I was, yeah, I was, I loved Jesus. I loved church. Moving to Miami after my freshman year, I think I just I just got off the path. It was never like, do I not believe in Jesus or is there not a God? It was more just rebellion. It was more insecurity and new environment, new space, trying to fit in, um, playing a part, uh, operating out of convenience, not conviction. And uh, I would say at 17 years of age in my senior year of high school, I was in Australia with my dad and he was preaching at an event. And I don't know who the preacher was that I was listening to. I just know the experience that I had with God, which was I encountered the Lord and with deep conviction and a deep sense of repentance. I just heard the Holy Spirit speak to me saying, how long are you going to run from your calling? And it was like a night and day shift of changing my behavior. Um really considering what I believe and how I would work that all out in my everyday life. And so my senior year, starting from January on, I think I was just a new creation. I just think I lived differently. If you can believe it, that happened in December or January of my senior year. And then I met Don Cherie, my wife, in February, wow. <laughs> just two months afterwards. And we started dating. And so it was sort of like the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, maybe is the way to say it, like of me having this encounter, not of a new truth, I, just a, a deep conviction of me going, yep, I'm, I'm done running. And then my wife, who I think has been the greatest gift God's ever given me, my partner, um, I met her 
at 17, which in many ways, uh, I've always kind of wondered. Yeah, it's, it's what it's, it's that funny balance. I don't know if you've got this, but it's like the Lord saved me, but I think at times, uh, the motivation of pleasing Don Cherie <laughs> yeah. sure helped me walk out my salvation journey a little bit. Meaning I just think that she was a great accountability partner. It was like, uh, God's grace is, uh, unmerited and God's grace is inexhaustible. Don Cherie's is not <laughs> like, like I was going to have to, uh, I was going to have to actually walk the, walk the line a little bit if I was going to keep her as my girlfriend. And so all of that, though, I think is just the providence of God of, of how that all came together. And so at 17 is really where that took root in my life. And in just the right time, Don Shree showed up and she was in my life and sort of the rest is history. It didn't mean that I, I, I haven't stumbled or messed up or question or doubted that those things have all happened on the journey. But since I was 17, I've been pretty focused on, I want to preach the gospel. I want to make Jesus known. I don't think I knew I wanted to be a pastor. I just think I knew I wanted to give my life to, to his mission and to his kingdom. So if you've been listening to this podcast for a while now, then obviously you've heard me talk about Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is a supplement that I started taking over a year ago. I love it because I hate taking pills. Um, I need something in the morning to give me energy boost that's clean and healthy, and Athletic Greens actually taste delicious. Most green drinks that I've tried in the past are bitter and they don't taste well. They're kind of um, clumpy and they're really grainy. But Athletic Greens is super smooth. It tastes delicious. It gives me energy. I feel like it helps pr promote my gut health. It helps with my immune system and it gives me the energy that I need. And I even feel like it helps with my recovery as well. So you may be thinking, well, Christian, that all sounds great, but what's actually in this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day off right. And this special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. And not only have I started taking Athletic Greens, but I've also sent it to my family and friends. My neighbor, who's actually a good friend of mine, just started taking it as well, and he's on the train. He loves it. Uh, my dad takes it. My mom takes it. And I think my dad travels with it as well, which is pretty cool. He loves his little travel packs that you just rip open and you just dump it in however much water you want. And they're super easy to bring on the go when you need a uh, healthy nutritional boost whenever you're traveling. And AG1 is also lifestyle friendly. So whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it fits in your lifestyle. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. And you don't have to just take my word for it. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. It's recommended by professional athletes and trusted by leading health experts. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash huff. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash huff to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. That's awesome. And that's really cool because it's really crazy. You literally are tracking because my neck, like, I was asking that, then my question after that was was the question of like, or was your faith more gradual? Which is just, this is crazy. You are literally saying the exact next thing that I've asked of you. Yeah. But that's cool that you, you brought up Don Shree because it was, it was the same for me and Sadie. I messaged Sadie like two months after <clears throat> I really turned my life around in college. And I was still kind of coming out of the funk and everything when I was telling Sadie's younger sister and one of her friends to set me up with Sadie. And they never would do it. And I would, I, would, I would be like, come on, just, you know, just put in a good word for me, whatever kind of thing. And they never would do it. And the next summer is when I met Sadie. And by the time I met her, I was fully on fire. So it was, you know, just even the sovereignty and just, you know, God's plan of if I, if Sadie would have messaged me back, the first time I ever messaged her, which was two years before we ever met, I was not in the spot to be in a, in a healthy relationship. And then if her, if her sister and friend had put in a good word for me, then I still was not in the best spot, so it wouldn't have been good. So I feel like God was just laughing every single time I kept trying to like, you know, put myself, you know, put myself in there. What did, what did you DM her? You're like, what's up, girl? Is your boy a Christian? No, so I was at Passion, and this is actually funny. So we were at Passion Conference, and so my life really took a turn in uh, 
like August, and this was in January. And we were at Passion, and someone we somebody had said that like Sadie was there, or whatever. And I was there with like twenty of my guy friends, and we had had um, we we rented this like little apartment in like downtown Atlanta. Uh, so we were all staying in this like Airbnb kind of thing. And she was on the screen. I think she was at like another location. I'm pretty sure. And all of my friends were were saying like, out of all of us, I was the only one that would actually have a shot, which is just funny. So they were like kind of hyping me up of like, out of all of us, you know, you're the only one that would ever have a shot. So I was like, okay, so I'll message her. So then I DM'd her like, hey, um, you know, I think you're beautiful. I love what God's doing in your life. Yada, yada, yada. Um, So that was in January of like 2017. And then we didn't meet until like 2019. And it was funny because when I went to follow her, no, no, no. When she went to follow me, that message popped up, and she had thought that I DM'd her like right after we met, but it was the message from like two years ago, um, which is how we started connecting. So it's just really, really funny story. But yeah, if I would have, um, oh, I met, like that. if I would have met Sadie, the times when I wanted to do it, it would not have been healthy or, or good. Um, and by the time, so we when you got me, when you got to like the beach that summer or wherever you met her at, you kind of already liked her, or it was like, nah, man, I I knew of her, and. I was maybe interested or, or you, or were you like, when you saw her, you're like, oh, I'm making this happen or it so, wasn't that clear? No. So it's funny. So my freshman year of high school, which is when their show started, I told one of my friends on the baseball team, I was going to marry her. Um, oh my Kind of like jokingly. Um, yeah. So then, yeah. Yeah. More so jokingly. But I think this girl is super dope, super cool. Like I'm gonna marry this girl. Yeah. A girl like this. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, um, so my after my freshman year, that was when I met her younger sister, and I'd always thought that she was, you know, really pretty. Uh, not her sister. I really th- always thought Sadie was really pretty. Um, but so Bella's when, really pretty, though. Yeah, no, yeah, like yeah, saying yeah, that, yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bella. <laughs> Bella, if you're listening, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, like the the oddest comment. No, but I mean, like. <laughs> sorry. No, no. I so when Bella. I Bella, so when best. I met so when I met Sadie, I was with my two girl cousins, and Sadie was with three of her girlfriends. And the whole night I was hanging out with her girlfriends because I was like, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to be too imposing. I don't want to, you know, push anything. Um, but when we left, I did shoot my shot. So she had, for some reason, dude, she had, she followed Chance on Instagram. She followed all my, co- she didn't follow me. She followed all my cousins except me. And I was like, this is the first time I ever met her. And I was like, hey, you know, you follow everyone else in my family except for me. Just, you know, why is that? And then she kind of like played it off like, oh, I don't know. But she intentionally did not follow me because she thought I was cute. So there we go. There, so that that that's the reason behind that. So then she followed me. Then that's know, why that I had to happen. stop following you for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have I actually have you muted because I can't look at you. <laughs> 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 Completely, <laughs> bro. I had to mute you this past year. Like, <laughs> so dumb. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. But yeah, no, it was so. It was when I met her on the beach. Um, I was like. I don't know if she, you know, noticed me or saw me or whatever, but I think she's awesome. And if if if, if, yeah. if that would work. so I, we were messaging in June, asked her on a date. Uh, we we had DM'd for like a few mu- for a few weeks, and I got her number, and we started talking on the phone um, throughout the week, and then I asked her on a date, and she said September. So we talked on the phone for like two months before before we ever went on a date. I drove up to Nashville, um, and spent the weekend up there. So that was fun. So yeah, so really, I mean, like you said, Sadie's been a great accountability for me. Just, yeah, really walking that line. Like you said, like, yes, I still want to, you know, obviously please God, but a byproduct of that is also pleasing my wife and, and trying to be a good husband and a father. And that's, I think that's just for everyone who's listening. It's like, that's the kind of person you want to align yourself with. Like, yeah, I, I want to, I want friends like that. I want mentors like that. I definitely want my spouse, but like I, you want people that are calling you higher and Don Cherie wasn't judgmental or legalistic towards me. She just had a standard. I just knew what the standard was going to be. If I was in a, and I loved her so much, wanted to be with her so much. It's like, that ain't going to work. I can't, this is not just some girl. This is the girl that I think God has planned for me. And I need to, I need to do right by all of this. And I also think just like for all the dudes that are listening um, yeah, I feel like there's like a fine line between the scripture says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And I always think it's funny. It's like, there's a fine line between, you know, searching and stalking, but yeah. it's a fine line. <laughs> like, yeah. like, meaning I just love, bro, you, you DM'd her two years ago. Uh, thank God 
you know, God's in control. So here comes the trust factor. I don't just believe in you, Jesus. I trust you. She didn't respond to my DM. Uh, the people I asked for her to reach out, they didn't reach out. And two years later, God in his perfect timing, he works it out. Uh, but I don't think that you did anything wrong there. I think yeah. you have to play your part and trust oh, that God's sure. going to play his part. Sure. And I think, I think a bunch of dudes, they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, God, got to work it out. And it's like, but you never DM'd. You never asked a friend to talk to her. You, you didn't shoot your shot on the, and they never ever step into, um, I think what maybe God has planned for them because there is this idea of God's sovereignty and then man's responsibility. And I think I'm just trying to land on the idea of like, your, I called Don Cherie for three months without her ever calling me. Mm-hmm. Like she had this, she was raised where it's like, you don't call boys and we weren't official. So like, yeah, yeah you, you're gonna have to call me. Oh, okay. So it's like, that's a kind of a weird, is this yeah. going good? I just only yeah. ever call you. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I wasn't used to any girls ever doing that with me, but I was uh, going to keep pursuing her. You know what I mean? Like yeah. um, on paper, that might kind of sound strange. Like, dude, you just keep calling this girl. I'm like, yeah, because I feel like this is the one I'm supposed to be with. And so I'm going to be, I'm going to pursue. I'm going to, I'm going to keep searching until she tells me not to. And uh, God in his perfect timing works it all out. But there was certainly responsibility on my end. Yeah. We joke about that narrow line between like stalking and like romantic. Like, yeah, you know, like, like, I don't like, want to like perpetuate yeah. something wrong here. I'm just going, yeah. I don't know. It's just like, yeah. dude, like, yeah, well, you gotta, well, you gotta well, fall on your face. Yeah. Well, cause you could be like, if you called her every day for three months, someone would be like, oh, that's a little much. But then someone else would be like, oh my gosh, that's so romantic. <laughs> like it's it all, is. it's all about, it's all about the perspective. Like, when it, when it works, it's romantic. When it doesn't, it's like, dude, you, you're, you're clinical. We, we need to, we need to get you checked out. Man. That's, we'll that's so you. true. It's all, it's all about the recipient. Yep, it is. So you started Voo Church in 2015. Um, yep. You know, what were you doing before that? Because I really don't, I don't really know about much about what you and Don Shapiro were doing before y'all started Voo. This podcast is sponsored by Faithful Counseling. So about two and a half years ago, uh, right when COVID hit, I was still in college. It was my senior year. I was going to be graduating in May. COVID hit in about March. So I had about two months of uh, online schooling and then I was going to be out in the real world. And honestly, it was stressful. Um, me and Sadie had just gotten married that November, and I kind of was just wrestling with, I did not know what I was going to want to do. Um, I travel a lot with Sadie, but I was still like, what am I you know, going to do? What am I going to be passionate about? And it was really just an interesting time of you know, needing somebody that I could talk to, whether it was uh, a counselor or just someone that could just listen to uh, me talk about uh, fears or anxieties or anything that I was going through and really having someone that I could talk to helped me a lot. It helped ease a lot of the worries that I was uh, experiencing that I never really experienced before and helped me uh, just have confidence in places that I did not know that I really necessarily even needed confidence. And maybe you're at a spot like what I was in, you know, life is throwing you a curveball uh, because life is full of twists and turns and it's important to show up for yourself and for your loved ones through all of life's struggles. And maybe you don't have somebody to talk to like I did. And I want to offer you uh, faithful counseling. Faithful counseling will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist who is also a practicing Christian. And faithful counseling is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. And if you're wondering why you should try therapy, maybe if you've never tried it before, um, my best piece of advice for therapy is you really get to talk to somebody who is going to listen, who's going to hear you, and who's not going to judge you for what you're going through or maybe for the crazy things that you might say. They're going to listen to you. They're going to provide feedback, but it's not going to be judgmental. Really just having somebody that can listen to you and provide insight and provide help and speak into uh, the things that you're going through in life. And you can also schedule video or phone sessions weekly. And you don't have to have the camera if you don't want to. And faithful counseling is also more affordable than traditional offline counseling. And if you need financial aid, it is available. And we all need somebody to talk to. If you don't have somebody, faithful counseling can be there to help. And you can even visit their website and you can read real testimonials from real people. And faithful counseling user AL says, he phrases things in a way I can understand well. He knows how to prioritize issues and address them effectively and with empathy. And right now, you can visit faithfulcounseling.com slash huff and get the faith-based counseling that you deserve. They've even got a special offer for 4 Men podcast listeners. Right now, you can get 10% off your first month at faithfulcounseling.com slash huff. Thanks again to Faithful Counseling for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, so Don Shree and I, we met 
in uh, 2002. So in fact, this February will mark 20 years of us hanging out. We've been That's married awesome. for 16 years. So uh, we graduated. We went to school in Cleveland, Tennessee at a Christian liberal arts college there called Lee University, um, not far from Chattanooga. Took Don Shree four years, took me five years. Hello. And uh, we went to school together. We had the best time ever. We were really, really involved at school and involved in campus life and worked jobs there in Cleveland. And we got time to graduate and we knew we wanted to go into the ministry, but we weren't clear as to where that was or what we should be doing. And we actually had some really great opportunities uh, that were offered our way, but we were home for the holidays. It must have been December of 2006. And uh, we came to Miami to see my parents. We were newlyweds, probably, I guess, six months in or four months into being married. And I was just with my parents and went to church that Sunday. My parents were doing uh, at a church that they were leading Assemblies of God Church, really kind of in uh, the inner city of Miami and North Miami, a uh, very diverse church. And I don't know, I, I was just there that Sunday, Sunday and I really just felt led of the Lord. Best way for me to explain it was I just felt led of the Lord to come and help my dad. I kind of felt like, I don't know what we're going to do forever, but I really feel like my dad and my mom, this ministry that they're doing, it's got a beautiful heart and a beautiful intention. And I just think I should give some years of my life to, to supporting him. It's kind of like that. That's probably the simplest way to say it. I don't know if yeah. it was even like that clear then, but it was like, I just need to go to Miami and help dad. And um, I think for Don Shree and I, we've always sort of like believed in the idea that unless we like put our hand to something for a certain amount of time, we're not going to see any results. And so I think for us, maybe like by year one or year two of being there, we're kind of like committed in our hearts. Like we're going to be here for at least five years regardless of what, like, what opportunities come or what offers come. We just want to say no to all that and say yes to this. And so we moved out in 2007 and dad was going, what do you want to do? I was like, well, what do you, what do you need me to do? He's like, uh, what do you want to do? And at the time, this is sort of probably where our, our stories are maybe similar was uh, Louis Giglio was leading a ministry in Atlanta at Andy Stanley Church called 722. And it was on Tuesday nights and it was a ministry for college students. And I used to drive down and hear Louis preach. Louis didn't know me and I didn't know him. But I was like, well, I want to reach young adults. And uh, there's this guy named Louis Giglio who has a Tuesday night service. And so I guess I'll do a Tuesday night service for for 20-somethings. And um, probably for the first year, I copied everything Louis ever did and tried to preach like Louis and sound like Louis. And he's not an easy one to, to copy. He's really not. <laughs> but we... We started this Tuesday night ministry called The Rendezvous. And probably by like year two, and there's more to that story too, but probably around year two, the thing just started to take off. And before you know it, two and a half, three years into it, it was 1,200, 20-somethings were showing up on a Tuesday night to this Bible study in Miami Gardens, which is uh, 95% black. So... I'm kind of like this white kid in this very diverse environment, but then kids are starting to come up from South beach from the beach and people are, kids are coming down from Fort Lauderdale. And then there's this crowd from Miami gardens. And so it kind of became this hodgepodge of all these young people and uh, sort of a new program of how to do church. And I think whenever you start like winning at something, like I always say the fastest way to leadership is to solve problems. And so if you go back 14 years ago, when we were starting the rendezvous, rendezvous just means meeting place. That's what we call the Tuesday night thing, real, real provocative title. Um, at the time, like the church was always talking about young adults, young adults. How do we reach young adults? And I don't think we even had the answer to it. I just think we were doing it. And yeah. whenever you start doing something, people are like, well, what are you doing? And so with that, it really kind of carved out a path that I found myself speaking at so many different events for young adults and for youth and it kind of started to create a platform, if you will, where I was preaching at all these things and preaching at churches that in many cases that were much larger than the church that I was a part of a much bigger operation organization. And, um, I think with that, it kind of people in the, in the church world, I, was, I started to kind of maybe become known to some degree. So I did that for eight years. And it was out of that, that after at the seven year mark, dad was like, what's in your heart. And at one point dad was thinking we would take on the church and then we kind of came to a place where he was like, I don't think I'm ready to, you know, pass the baton. I think that you guys should go and start your own independent church. 
And that was even kind of awkward as we were figuring that all out. But eventually we all kind of came to an agreement. I was like, all right, yeah, he's like, stay in Miami. And so we went about 30 minutes south of him and we launched Vu Church, which was short for Rendezvous. And that's sort of how that all kind of came about. But before we had launched the church, we had started a conference. We were making music. Uh, we were doing pastors networks, so many different things. And so the church sort of began with somewhat of a profile or somewhat of slightly being known, but uh, it's obviously evolved and grown into what it is now today and it continues to become something. So yeah, I think there was about eight years of just serving at my dad's church, Trinity Church. And I did all the minute. I was the executive pastor at, by the end there, leading all the different ministries and grateful for all of those opportunities and all those experiences. Yeah, that's awesome. I did not, I did, I did not know that rendezvous started from your dad's church. That's so cool. Yep. Totally that's awesome. That's it, was, awesome. it was under dad's forever. It was yeah. some, of the, some of the best years ever, bro. Tuesday night, like doing ministry like that with your friends. And, yeah. and it was kind of like, um, it was really fun because, yeah, you never know how beautiful the seasons are, right? You're in until you get out of them, it feels like. So it's always like mm -hmm. looking back, like that was awesome. What was so cool was that we were given so much freedom to be like creative and there wasn't much to lose. Now today it's all like, there's eyes. And so it's like, but bro, we were just yeah. taking our shot every week, just doing the craziest stuff. And uh, there wasn't like a fear in the world. It was just like, let's go for it. Yeah. No and uh, I kind of, I kind of miss some of that. Yeah. None of that. No, no cancel yeah. culture and nobody knew who we were. Nobody knew what we were doing. We were in Miami gardens. It was like, yeah. people were just excited to hear about Jesus and people were getting saved. That's awesome. Well, you, um, you know, like I said earlier, you're a husband, you have, um, you know, three kids, you're, you pastor a large church for someone listening and maybe who follows you on social media or who knows who you are. Are there any, cause I'm, I'm even just interested to know. Are there any like unique disciplines that you put into place to help train yourself spiritually for, you know, for all that, all that you have to do? Yeah. I mean, I think I firmly believe in habits and practices. Um, a simple way to define habits are, you know, habits, the thing are the things that you do, um, almost involuntarily. Mm -hmm. uh, I preached a message years ago. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do your habits. So when we find ourselves in situations where we're like, I don't know what the next thing is to do. When you have healthy habits and healthy practices, uh, doing those things, those involuntary things, if they're healthy, it'll kind of help create pathways for you to do the things that you, it, it'll, it'll create vision. It'll create brain waves. It'll create, um, new thoughts. So for me, some of those habits are for cer certainly working out. Um, it's a big one for me. It's not just about my, Physical, I, I've learned that working out for me is really a mental exercise. So a beautiful spiritual practice that I think people should lean into is the spiritual practice of meditation. And um, I believe in meditation. Uh, I'm just not very good at it. But what I have discovered is that working out produces the same results for me in many ways that meditation does. Yeah. The idea of meditation is to, is to, is to harness and focus your, your mind. Mm -hmm. that it's not filled. I think so many of us have such levels of anxiety because we're so distracted. We're so we're everywhere in our mind and we can't bring it to one focused moment. What working out does is that when you get your breathing levels to the point of where I can't breathe, or when you're pushing something like a sled and your heart rate is jacking up, what it does is it's actually focusing your mind that you're not able to think about yesterday. Mm -hmm. You're not able to think about tomorrow. You have to be right there in the present. And so any Good. practice that can bring you to the present is a beautiful, beautiful practice for spiritual formation. What does the scripture say? It says, be still and know that I am God. So many people don't know who God is because they never get still enough to learn it. It's like, is God still speaking? Of Yeah, God's speaking. It's not a speaking problem that God has. It's a speed problem that you and I have. Mm -hmm. We're moving too fast. We're jumping from one thing to the next. So meditation is about getting still. And as I get still, I can hear from God. I, I'm learning. I do two minute meditations as part of my daily routine. But for me, I've found some hacks, which is working out, cold plunging, getting a cold plunge. It's really hard to be worried about the budget sheet or really worried about the fight with your wife. You are trying to survive for three minutes. and yeah. 
what I find out is the relief it does to my mental health is, is everything. And so, um, I don't work out for vanity. I work out for sanity, you know, is one of the practices. I think another great practice is reading, um, study. So God's word, of course, but also just, I, I, I find that when I'm learning, when I don't know what to do, I know what to do. I'm, I'm learning. And as I'm learning, I think there's a thing called the compound effect that I've been in ministry now for 15 years. And so when I'm preaching a sermon, even it's not just that sermon that I'm preaching. It's like, why is Louis Giglio hard to, to copy? Because this joker has got a compound effect that we can't even, it's like that, it's that age old picture of like, of like the iceberg, right? You just see mm-hmm. the tip of the iceberg, but underneath it is this. Yeah. So a man like Louis Giglio, I, I'm using him as a point of reference because he's a hero for both of us. And I know that you guys have a tight relation with him, but like you, you, you're, you're taking the tip, but, but it's, it's the thing underneath. Mm-hmm. So I like, I like information. I like learning. I like studying. That's obviously starts with God's word, but it's also just like reading into other areas and growing that maybe there's a category of my life that I think like I'm not growing in. But if I can, if I can pinpoint victory towards, man, my mind got better over the course of this past year. And if my, if my body and my, in my, and my mind got better through working out and practices, progress is what I think we're all addicted to not perfection. So if you can change those things in your mind, they become wonderful, wonderful practices. So for me, simple habits in my life is working out, which is good for my physical body, but also good for my mental health, studying of the scriptures and, and learning are, are both great things for my mind and for my soul. Um, and then the other little practice that I think is just simple is like Don Shri and I are in a small group. We call it Vu Cruz. And it's now been seven years of doing that. And I just think as, as time goes on, I, I'm just realizing just how important that is. Just the, I, I call it a practice because that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I don't always feel like going to crew. Oh, we're going to go sit down. It's not always deep revelatory meetings. It's not always, it's just the practice of subjecting myself to a circle of people that you have to look at in the face and say, Hey, how are you doing? Here's my prayer request. Here's my praise report. It's a practice. It's formation. I think one of the great tragedies of COVID is the disruption of what it was to the church. I don't think that people don't believe in Jesus anymore or don't believe even in the church. I think people actually believe in the church, but it's like the gym. I don't know anybody who doesn't believe in working out. Yeah, of course I believe working out is good. But when you stop working out for a year, you can still believe that it's valuable, but you have lost the habit of of practicing it. And I think that's what's happened with, I think church is a practice. I think crew is a practice. It's something that I have to, I have to do consistently. And it's not what I'm doing occasionally that matters. It's what I'm doing consistently. And I think the practices for me that I'm committed to when it comes to my formation would be physical fitness, which I think creates results of meditation. I think it's prayer and study and then learning in some other spaces. And I think it's community, church life, and, and Vu crew life. And it's made a world of a difference in, in, for me. Twice a year, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. I think it's a big deal too. Fasting, just things that don't get talked about much. Denying your flesh in a category to, to feed your spirit has reaped incredible rewards for me in my life. Yeah, man, that is awesome. I really, I, I really, I really don't know what to say all that. That was, that was so, that was so much in like five or six minutes, but it's so, so wise. And you're so articulate, man. Um, I really can't thank you enough for joining me. Uh, we love you and Don Shereen. If you're listening, seriously, Rich Wilkerson Jr., Voo Church, type in uh, anywhere, social media. Um, go to YouTube. Uh, same thing, Rich Wilkerson Jr., uh, Life in the World Barrel. I really think that message will change your life. Uh, Rich, we love you, man. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I really think people are going to be uh, impacted, challenged. And um, yeah, man, you know, look at their physical health and their fitness, but also, um, you know, wondering if they're believing in Jesus or if they're more so trusting in him and truly following him. So thanks so much for joining me. I love you, bro. Thanks for having me. Let's just start doing this once a month, you know? Let's start doing this. I mean, I literally could have asked you like 20 more things. I hope you know that. So (laughs) we'll do it again. I like it. I like talking to you. You're amazing. We're for you. We'll hang soon. Thank you, man.